it smells like leather because the leather's from Keystone, Pennsylvania. The welts are from Massachusetts. The upper's from Horween. The insoles from Pennsylvania. The linings from Milwaukee. There's, there's, you know, that's what it's gonna smell like. So you can make a bad product or you can make a good one. So hey everybody, this is Phil from Ashton Leather. I've got Wyatt here today to talk to us about different types of leather that he chooses for use in all their different shoes and boots that they make at Grant Stone. And I don't know, I know a good amount about leather, I don't know everything, but I don't know much at all about shoemaking. So sure. I want you to help me with that. And then lastly, I wanted to go into uh, why somebody would want to pick Grant Stone um, because these shoes are absolutely amazing, but I want to know a little bit more detail. Let me ask you this. What's, yeah. What, I see the style that you're wearing. Yeah. Is that the style you would choose for yourself from everything yeah. you make as a penny loafer? Yep. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like the loafers the most. Um, they're the most comfortable to me. Yeah. I mean, I like the way they look, everything about it. If you were going to suggest a style to me, a guy that wears jeans, I kind of yep. work at a workshop, like crafts yep. person living in a city where the, we have hot summers and winters, what would you suggest for me? I mean, you can you yeah. can see all the stuff I have. I'm kind of like a work boot guy. But. Yeah, I mean, if you're going towards boots, then yeah, I guess there's other boot we don't have here is we have that hand-sewn Ottawa boot, which is like a mock with the Algonquin in the center, like the stitch down. Mm. So we have that one as well. Yeah. Without a, a doubt, the diesel is our best seller. One reason is because it's a plain toe boot. Another reason is we have more leathers available in that. This is the only one. And it's just easy, right? Like that's yeah. a, a relatable boot. Yeah, and this is the only one right now that has a leather sole. Mm. Uh, when we started, I really wanted to do everything in leather sole. Um, and not but, the, uh, the day-night style. Yeah, and that's, that's a rubber sole that we made. And so when we first started with rubber soles, of course, the obvious option was to use, you know, a day night outsole, but it just didn't, it didn't line up with our outsole. I mean, really the cost, yeah, it, it can cost a little bit more and everything, but it really wouldn't be a big deal. It's just that the outsole pattern, it would be hanging over and then you have the stitches going directly through the studs, you know, which a lot of people do that and it's not a big deal, but it's like, or we just invest in our own mold and make an outsole yeah. that we like the way we want it to, that fits our last exactly right. And then the production people aren't like bringing down 10 pair every day. Like, hey, is, right. this, is this an issue? Can, you know, well, so why did you yeah. want, I think that's fascinating. They want all the boot bottoms to be, all the shoe bottoms everything. to be leather. I want why? everything to be leather. Uh, you just love leather or is it yeah, better some, in some yeah, way? I just, I, yeah, the leather sole, I mean, it gets a little bit of a bad rep, um, but at the same time, it's super personal. So if people don't like leather, then they don't like it. You know, it's too slippery. I bad rep for slipperiness. I live in Seattle, you know, th that type of thing. But at the same time, you know, someone like my grandpa, you know, he's just like, he's appalled when he sees our boots with rubber on it. You know, he's really? just like, how can he make such a nice boot and put rubber outsole on? They make rubber outsole stuff too. It's just when that's something he prefers, especially on a shell quarter then, you know, he's just like, why would you put rubber on it? It's just like, well, people, you know, if we have, you know, our, our most recent pre-order, we were only making 30 pairs and uh, the majority would prefer rubber, you know, on their boot. You know, it's just more versatile for them. I do think the aesthetic, the aesthetic is different. Oh, the aesthetic, the leather looks, is, again, is, so opinion, but it, it looks so much better. It's so much more rich. You know, you have, you can put a stain on the entire thing. So you have this huge outsole frame that is just like antique, whatever color you want yeah. versus that you're looking like at. Like you're walking rubber. on a uh, cool piece of stained wood or something. Yeah, exactly. Well, We've that, had plenty of people say, hey, I don't like these wood soles, but. Uh, <laughs> well, it's yeah. just so dense it could be mistaken yeah. for wood. So but, why, I mean, is it because the aesthetic and also that it molds a little bit better your foot or is there anything to do with comfort? Yeah, I mean, it totally can. I mean, especially if you wear the shoe for a while, if you're not putting shoe trees in, you'll see like your shoe has, we are talking about your boot has toe spring, you know? Yeah, And because I'm it, a bum and I don't use my... Well, yeah. People and, get pissed at me, but when I show videos of my stuff that, that I don't put shoe right. trees in, people get pissed. Right. Like, do you clean your shoes? They're mad at me. And I, you know what? Yeah, They're well, I mean, right. boots, it's not as common. It's not as common for people to use trees and, and boots and stuff. Um, usually not as concerned about creases and polishing it as often. I just want to wear them. Yeah, so I mean, it's not a big deal, you know? And so like the leather, it will, it'll conform with your midsole, with your insole, and just, just like the rest of the boot does, so. Well, be real with me yeah. though, would you suggest shoe trees? Because I have, I don't know, 50 pairs of boots and shoes. Should I, I mean. Should I, because I don't wear them all, right? It, yeah. I. Do I maintain it that way by letting them, letting them sit with trees? Honestly, you know, long-term, 
um, you're probably not going to see a big difference in like, whoa, I got an extra year out of my shoe, like longevity and things like that yeah. for putting shoe trees in your product. I mean, you're probably not. So, but will it's it honestly, keep the shape definitely, better, better? Definitely. More for comfort, probably a little bit better. No, no. for look. Just for the look. Yeah. Because I'm getting the toe spring like you described. And Well, and, and yeah, that, and that's like a very small part oh, of it. I think it's more about the upper. Here, know? let's bring the... I'm gonna yeah. bring these out. So yeah. these are not as bad as some as the other ones, but yeah. when you say toe spring, you're talking about the toe going up like a clown shoe. Right. And that's happening because I'm not using shoe trees. No, I mean, it's wear, and then if you use shoe trees, it'll help it a little bit, just because you're filling out the vamp here, and it'll, it'll, it'll keep this leather part, you know, basically your, your vamp will kind of be pushed up a little bit. So naturally, right. naturally it's gonna stretch, be you know, it'll keep your shoe kind of, you know, it's almost like putting the last back in just like when you put your foot in, obviously the shoe kind of flattens out a little bit. You know? I see. So if you put the last back in, it's going to kind of go back to that shape versus having this rolling, rocking shape. So, I mean, the shoe tree will help that a little bit, but if it doesn't bother you, it doesn't really matter. I mean, some people are like, well, the shoe tree has wicking properties, and I shouldn't be saying all these things because we sell shoe trees. So yes, buy a ton of them. Buy, but, buy all the shoe trees. And I, I mean, I'll put them in some of my shoes, that, especially like the shells and stuff that I want to keep you know, well, the moisture thing, I, I thought that was the main reason, but you're saying it's not necessarily a big no, deal? No, no, yeah, it is. It, it helps. It helps with the, the, the wicking and, and all those things. But at a, there's a certain time when, you know, when I was living in China and the humidity was high, shoe trees actually made it difficult for them to dry. Moisture, probably. It held moisture. And I'm talking if they got really wet. I mean, I got oh. stuck in monsoons all the time going to work. Um, I didn't have a car. So you know, because you're in the city. And so it's like all the time, like a lot of people probably get stuck in the rain. And so when your shoe's like totally soaked all the way through, not a great idea to throw a shoe tree in it. Like really? right away. It can probably pull a lot of the moisture out of it and everything, but probably not necessary. A lot of people say, hey, give it give it an hour, even on a, like a dry day. People say, take them off, give it 20 minutes, put a shoe tree in. Interesting. I think it's a combination of all of that. Just kind of trying it wherever you live and everything. And especially when you get into more of a dress shoe, like a cap toe or something you know, then it's makes sense. That's probably, I think that's you know. my, my escape route. Right. It's like, I don't do a lot of dress stuff. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Well, let's go back to these. I would ask your, your favorite is the penny loafer. You would suggest if a casual guy wears jeans, diesel boot. What about like my dad? My dad's yeah. like a medical sales guy. Yeah. He's traveling around a lot. Yeah. Like, what, I mean, what would like a 60 year old man like? I mean, honestly, this shoe is probably the most underrated because like for you even, um, I do look, I like a whole cut though. I yeah. like a sort of minimalist. Well, this, this, this plain toe shoe is just, especially with the combinations we have, okay. Natural chrome Excel or a black, you know, calf with a natural welts and, and outsole stain. They're very, very casual, you know? And so you can wear them with denim and, and everything else. And so your, your question about someone like 50, 60s, I mean, actually when we look at our average customer, that's actually the case were closer to high 40s, mid 50s. Really, I guess, yeah, it's more about your profession. You know, I mean, if, if you can wear this and, the, you know, this isn't too casual, uh, then great, you know. This is probably one of the most, you know, underrated shoes, you know, the buck, just because you can wear it with chinos, you can wear it with denim, yeah. raw denim. You can wear it with, you know, the likes of a J. Crew. I mean, they'll market this with a gray suit, you know, or a navy buck or a gray buck with a, you know, a navy suit, you know. So I, I think all of, the, the majority of our line, it is kind of that business casual yep. where you can just kind of get into wearing, um, you know, of course we do have the cap toe Oxfords for, you know, more suiting. Yeah. I think that's, that sort of ran the gamut of different styles. And we, since we are sharing, yeah. uh, yeah. The, the, the demo for Ashland turns out is like exactly you and me. It's like, okay. Yeah. If, if YouTube has like really good, uh, analytics yeah and they <laughs> it makes me kind of sad right we're like 99.9 .9 male okay and mostly like 30 okay like 30 to 35 right so it's right. me yeah um, <laughs> basically, basically just talking to myself about you and your friends yeah it's probably why it works all right i i, I do love these natural chrome excel hole cuts but uh, or excuse me dune chrome excel yeah it's natural though it's okay it's yeah. na i'm sorry and this is uh crimson <laughs> Yep. Crimson Chrome Excel? Because this... Yeah, it's a Havana Brown, yep. I want to talk about this leather, but it, it, the way that you finish this, and I see a lot of Chrome... We sell Chrome Excel wallets. The way that you finish it is a very... Um, 
filled in yep. and in a great way. Like this is very nice. Like, I don't know if you're able to tell me, but yeah. are you using like a very waxy polish to sort of fill in these or? No, I mean, it's a normal, it's a normal brown shoe polish, but we use, you know, the Carnuba like filler wax. It's even, it does that for you on a wheel uh, at the factory level. Oh, the wheel. So we actually, it's interesting that you use the wheel. Maybe it's because we're not using the, the, that straight, you're just using straight wax on it? Yes, a Carnuba wax, yeah. Wow, yeah, because we, I noticed that when I put stuff through the wheel that's Chrome Excel, we are ripping finish off. And okay. I, I don't know if I've developed enough of a finish layer. I mean, that was kind of one of the reasons we even call this tune is because we do put a brown shoe cream, a light brown shoe cream on this one. So, you know, I don't want to mislead people like they're getting a natural Chrome Excel and they get it, it's a little bit darker and then they're disappointed. We do the same thing with the Crimson, which is Havana Brown. We use a darker brown shoe cream and we cover the, cover the entire boot, you know I mean? And then the final step, you know, where they're packing and everything else is they're polishing it with a Carnuba wax and a wheel, which it does. It gives it a nice sheen. Some it people, also feels great too. It doesn't yeah, feel mad or sticky. Right. Like right. I've had other uh, footwear that I felt like, especially on the shell finishing, like I can, I feel like I see finish. Yeah. On this, I don't feel that sense at all. It, yeah. it, it feels natural still, but just right. shiny and filled in. It, it seems like the majority of our customers, they do like that because it's not as common, but some people don't. They're like, I want a matted, you know, Chrome Excel. I want the original Chrome Excel look. And I'm just like, okay, wear it for a week and you'll be fine. Yeah, <laughs> like, pretty much. <laughs> wear it for a week and don't brush it and you'll be, you'll be back to square one. So I mislabeled this boot earlier as a diesel boot. And the, the diesel bush is a plain toe? Yep. So I, I do like this cap toe. What was the thought process of leather choice on this guy? I, I do like yeah. hearing how you're, and I, it's not something that never occurred to me that you, sure. you had enough thought in this to, yeah. to specifically choose the different leather types with different soles, all the details. Uh, I just want to hear more about, because I like, maybe it's a horroring thing here, but I do like this boot an awful lot as well. And I, I yeah. want to know what went into the thought behind this. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think one of the, the things that we kind of have to address when we're making something or you know, when I'm choosing a, a pattern and the material is, is it going to be kind of business casual? Is it very casual? Is it work? And it, it's tough to even label things now, especially like in the US because people dress there is no work attire standard or whatever. Our diesel boot, which is this boot here, you know, it comes off looking more, a touch more like a work boot, simply because you've got raw edges, the eyelets are a little bigger, you actually have seven instead of eight, so it's a little wider, pulled apart, it looks more like your classic, like, hard-working boot, you know, and, and a little bit less like a dress boot, where this is, you know, slightly more refined it's got you know these are cropped a little bit tighter when you say cropped a little tighter the speed the speed hooks are cropped tighter and the eyelets yep all of them just because actually the dimension here is very very similar it's just that we actually kind of re you know uh respaced everything mm -hmm. to put an extra eyelet in there and then also when you actually lace it up it's going to come up closer together you know in general depending on the person but this is going to crop you see less lace you know it's not like wide open it doesn't look so much like a work boot it, it is cleaner you know you have your bigger quarter panel you don't have this this backstay here, uh, or the um, heel counter area here, which is separate. So it looks a little bit cleaner. Um, so yeah, it's all subtle things, but it does look a little bit dressier. But then if you have a guy who wears like real dress boots, he's like, this still doesn't look, you know, very dressy. So it's somewhere in the middle. It's like it's a kinda, hybrid. Yeah, it's a business casual. Well, you <laughs> might you might make fun of me that I'm wearing um, I'm wearing these uh, the Roy boots, the point two boots right now. Yeah. Uh, and I wore these at my wedding. Yeah. In a suit because I, I just love them yeah and i thought it worked it well you know it's yeah. yeah i mean that's like i feel like there's this weird like uh and the whole thing with like matching your belt to your shoes like yeah. i wonder if these rules are just sort of irrelevant now and i'm definitely not uh super well versed in like in the whole menswear part of that but you know the only thing that i do see is just like it's just whatever people like now yeah you know it doesn't matter the rules have kind of gone away to a certain extent um but at the same time even for what we sell i hope they don't go away completely because you know you, you do you have a lot of people who are who just think why would i spend this type of money on a heavy shoe like this when i can mm. buy a clean tennis shoe for 90 dollars? oh it i looks, see just kind of the whole style thing and everything so i think some of the history and the classic style whether it's yeah whatever those things are um if it goes away completely, it, it's tough on this business too, you know, just because it, people will move away from um, 
you know, goods of all shoes. You know, you also have people, like probably a lot of your customers who are buying leather goods into the denim, like raw denim yep. and things like that. That's a little bit different of a scene though, but they're into, they want to buy things that kind of last a little bit longer, well, I, wear differently. I think you know, long, like right. long wings with a denim pair, like yeah. that combo looks great to me too. Like yeah. I think it works the other way as well. Right. Yeah, definitely. But I definitely. think, yeah, maybe it's just do whatever you want. Like there are I mean, no it, rules anymore. Yeah. And I mean like, I mean, one of our first shoes are actually our first plain toe shoe. This shoe is in a black calf, French calf with these natural welts and outsole. You know, it's like, that's a hybrid. <laughs> there you go. I mean, that, it was perfect for denim. I mean, every single picture we, we posted of that and, and marketed it up, it was, it was with rogue territory, dark denim, you know, with, with that shoe. That well, I, and before we started talking, you were, you're, and I am the biggest Halloween fan and I'm very yeah. biased, but you were yeah. talking about this yeah. uh, and the diesel boot. What is this leather? Again? And, uh, and you were telling me this is your absolute favorite leather of the moment? No, or am no, I yeah. totally no, <laughs> ruining no. your opinion? So this is Battalassi out of Italy. Mm. Um, and this, this leather, they're kind of known for the Minerva box, which has a little bit of a grain to it. Um, this is the Minerva, which is smoother. So you can actually almost polish it a little bit and it has a little bit of shine to it. It's you know, pit tan, veg tan. It's it's very, tan. very grainy. Like it's a very pronounced grain that it looks like you've filled in nicely yeah, with your and finishing. Yeah, it just smells insane. It's the only, actually the only product we've ever sold that customer said, when I opened the box, I, I smell like, you know, like a saddle shop or something. Well, tell me what's in, if you could give me like a top three things you love about this. The, the smell you mentioned, yep. but I don't know if you mentioned, you mentioned off camera that yep. you like how this wears in. Yeah, I mean, the patina, how does it wear? It, it, you know, for example, I mean, you, you probably can't see in the camera and things like that, but you know, these dark areas, I mean, that's just literally from, you know, being touched and burnished on those areas a little bit more. So it builds a patina much quicker than anything else I've ever seen. Where Chrome Excel, which is also, I mean, it's, it's Chrome Excel, it is what it is. It's, how, it's hard to beat it. It's, it's the best at what it does, you know, being this forgiving leather with a ton of character where this is, you know, especially this one, these, you know how these dent very easily because it's a soft leather yep. and things like that. You this don't notice patinas. this, that doesn't dent very much? It's a little it, bit harder, firmer. A, a hair but characteristic it, of veg is that it yeah. dents. Yeah, and this will, I mean, especially compared to like calf, it will. But the way that it darkens is unbelievable. So mm. my dad has a pair of these and he destroys every pair of shoes or boots he has. That's that's all he does. And uh, like he, he mows a lawn in them and stuff. Yeah. Uh, like this is his favorite stuff. And his boots are, they're ridiculous. I love that. They're ridiculous. Are they all just green now from? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like dark brown, like red, yellow. It's it's craziest thing I've ever seen. But that's awesome. I wouldn't suggest it, but you can I might do, do those with yeah. my shell boots. Yeah, see what happens. exactly. I mean, so it is, it's that, the smell, um, you know, every year when we go to Japan, like we'll go there for like development stuff or whatever and uh, in Tokyo and people use this leather all over the place. So yeah, the, this leather is really, really interesting that way, mm. which some people, if they're used to the likes of a Chrome XL or some of these soft tumbled leathers and shoulder, you know, they get this and like, it's kind of stiff and it, but it's a different animal. Well, yeah. And I think the, when I look at this, if I look very quickly, yeah. I've seen too much leather to, to not be able to know the difference, but I think a lay person would look at this yep. and think that the way that you've polished it looks like shell because sure. it's very f smooth. Yep. Um, but what I've noticed in some of those videos that, uh, that I've seen is the it starts to crease a little bit more. It's got a little bit of a yeah. coarse break Yes. Um, when compared to like a, most other leathers, I right. would say. Yeah, and like you're and saying, the, veg I think and, people yeah. should embrace that though. I think the break thing, like especially in a casual, like you said, this is designed to be a casual style. Right. I don't think that should be a concern for people. I think a tight break, I associate that with more of a formal yeah. aesthetic. Yeah. And I think on a work boot, it could it could be totally cool looking. I've seen some tumbled leathers with a lot of pebbling. Right. On work boots that look super cool. So. Yeah, and those characteristics. I mean. That's what make it so popular, like in Japan, for leather workers and everything else. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's different. It's different. And it takes longer to break in because it is a little bit stiffer. But once it breaks in, it's kind of like a veg tan leather insole. It's like it's stiff, 
people are like, well, it's not comfortable. It's like, well, if you give it a month, yeah, it'll mold you, around. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's just one of those situations that it takes time. Uh, let's move on to the last really yeah. nice pair of boots that you brought, and I know what leather this is, but do you want to introduce this boot to everybody? Yeah. So this is like. Um, We've been getting slowly into the shell. I mean, we've been doing it for quite a few years now, but only with Horween shell for the last year and a half. And um, this is the natural shell, and we call it the honey glazed. Kind of the same concept. You know, we do use shoe creams and everything else and kind of polish it a little bit. So, you know, we don't want someone to get it and be like, well, it's darker than my other natural shell quarter than shoes or wallets I have or something like that. So it can be a little bit darker. But uh, yeah, it's just... And it's because of your finishing method? Right, yeah. And, and I mean, also too, like, we're, we're not... I, I guess we don't have, like, that cookie-cutter standard as far as, like, we get it in and, okay, this is too light, let's let's color it. It's just like, as you know, these natural shells, I mean... Oh, it's all over. Yeah, the quarter's going to be one color, that's going to be light. And so, like, we'll even use, I mean, neutral Venetian cream sometimes. I mean, that will darken. Yes. That will darken it and stuff. And it's like, that's It makes great. it red, a little red, too. Definitely. Definitely. It's kind of interesting. People don't so, know that. Right. But if we have areas that are very light, if you use that, it can blend things a little bit. And it just, you know, it seems like it kind of nourishes the leather and stuff. So You know what I like about the way that you finished this? And I'm jealous. I like it a lot. The way that this shell has been finished is, again, it's very natural. Like yeah. you're, you're doing something um, that I think I haven't seen in very many places. Yeah. Especially on the, the shell boots and shoes that I've seen. Um, like I, I just, sometimes I feel like I have a, on the other shell stuff, there's like a layer of wax sure. that I can see when I flex it. And that's why I was sort of folding the boot here yeah. on the top to see if I could see that. Right. I don't see it. It's like, yeah. it's blended very nicely. It's like tastefully done where it's not yeah. over finished yeah. and it's very smooth and it, the color is great. Like props, well, right? Yeah. Well, thanks. I mean, do you and, have a secret you want to share? Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, I, I think you know, there, there isn't anything too technical about any of these and the way it's done. It's just usually we're using a, a shoe cream after lasting. And it's usually one that has a little bit of like the moisturizing and, and conditioner type of properties just so it doesn't dry out, which kind of creates that like cracking look or just kind of dull matted look. Mm -hmm. So we usually do that. And then towards the end, um, after, you know, sanding the heels and attaching the outsoles, all, all that stuff, then we'll go add another coat and then actually just polish it, whether it's depending on the wax and the color. Usually we'll stick with neutral on just about everything when it comes to, to waxes, unless it's black, just use black. Um, the shell cordovan, to date, we've only done pre-orders. You know, we have a few shells here and there coming in. One lady, she's doing the finishing on every pair. And she's, wow. she's like, she's amazing what she does. She doesn't even know exactly what shell cordovan is or the background or the history. She knows exactly how to to manage the material just by using it over the years. And she knows, yeah, she's awesome. I mean, it's very obvious um, she knows what she's yeah, doing. Yeah, you know, all the samples and stuff that we do, like this is in the sample room that she kind of manages. And, um, and this wasn't instructed by you or your team at all? She just sort of figured this out? No, I mean, we, I was there when we started doing all this, the uh, the shell cordovan. At the time, it wasn't Horween, we are using uh, Kamapel, and now we've just kind of used Horween only. Um, but we just came up with a shoe cream it's called the number four shoe cream. And it, it just has like, it's like an off white color, but it doesn't strip the color at all or anything like that, but it doesn't add to it necessarily. Right. Um, and we found it works on a lot of colors uh, versus putting, you know, too many dark browns or blacks and things like that on it. So yeah, we, we just use neutral here. Right. Even on black, we okay. just use neutral. Yeah. But I just think it's the most natural looking. Right. And that's kind of what you should do with shell, right? Just try to keep, just show the article and not, I mean, not cover it. You could probably get some, much. you probably get some like fun effects if you're trying to be crazy. You right. Know, put black on top of natural, be right. maybe a little funky. Are these all the different boots and shoe styles? No. No. How many got, different styles do you have? I don't know the top of my head. Um, so like a main one I didn't bring was a long wing. Um, that was one of the first styles of patterns we had. We started with two, just the plain toe and the long wing. I remember wing. that. Yep. So we had we have a few of the long wing, you know, in, in calf and things like that. So that's actually one leather we don't have here, um, is our calf leather that we get from Anna Nay. I wouldn't have guessed that I liked the, the whole cuts the most. I was actually still surprised that yep. that's my favorite. And I'm not surprised that you suggested the diesel boot. I'm going to have to try these out. Yep. And uh, before I had you in, I was redoing the recon. 
Yeah. And I was asked, I was looking on YouTube videos and just reading around the internet what people are saying yeah. about Grant Stone. And I can see the, the initial impression, and I can see why everybody's saying this now, is the shoes look great. Sure. They're awesome. Um, and then the, there's always this like awkward but. People yeah. go on and on about like, wow, this shoe looks great. They use great leathers. Yeah. They fit great and like super comfortable, but they're made in China. And yeah. I want to put the elephant in the room, sort yeah. of ambush you with that question because yeah. I think if you can explain like what a good thing about manufacturing your brand in China is, then I think people will be helped to, to push them over the edge to start to try different products that you are making. Yeah. The way that I, I see it, and I guess what I always go back to when, when someone asks is, is just, um, it's my only experience. You know, I, I didn't work for another shoe factory. Um, I've never done anything else. It was my first job. Uh, it's still my only job. Um, that factory is kind of my family. Of course, our market is the U.S. You know, I'm American. I, we're here in the U.S. now. Uh, the majority of our sales are in the U.S. So a lot of that is the American perspective comparing to, let's say, a, a couple other brands or a few other brands uh, that would be American. But sometimes I'll see, you know, for your own style form or Reddit, you know, you have another group that says, well, you know, I only buy English shoes. But of course they still have, you know, they're like they, under, they know what China is, they know how China manufactures or the history and things like that. And so they're not exactly known for making um, great Goodyear Welt men's dress shoes. That's true. Right. And I think that's where you're fighting an uphill battle. Right, yeah. right. And so for us, it's kind of like, this is our product and I can break it down for you. I'm not going to compare it to other brands, but this is exactly what we do. It's a great solid product. And even, it's, even it's with, different Honestly, enough. even yeah. without the price, like if you, yeah. Right. Straight up, like if right. you told me these were made in Maine sure. or wherever, sure, I would believe you. Yeah, because there's no, there's nothing that gives it off. And the the thing I mentioned to you that that strikes me, yeah, every time I get literally any product from China, is, but especially footwear, is that smell. You just, it just smells like adhesives to me. Yep. And there's like this, like just so your initial response from most yeah. Chinese things are this sort of like. Okay, they didn't pay attention. Well, yeah, not to get too controversial here, but there's like, yeah, to me, there's like two points. The first point is your product is what you put into it. And it's like, I did this for other brands, only American brands for years. Um, that factory can make bad shoes too. If you request to use these products because you're looking at a price point. And I think, you know, sometimes we have to think about that a little bit like well we, i bought something from china and it was bad it's like do you really think a chinese company has set up and, and created that product and sent it over here those are people from here, america yeah or whoever they're specking a product based on price or whatever they know what they're making and they're shipping it to you i mean it seems not, like you're specking it not, based on yeah. the aesthetic you like and your right. knowledge of the footwear industry and how right. shoes work right and it's just the chinese labor pool is very very strong and so if today I want to start a t-shirt company, but I could care less about quality, I could care less about materials, but you're like, well, I guess obviously I'll go, to, I'll go find a factory in China. I'll send them this crappy fabric and I'll sell these shirts for $9.99 based on whatever. Product probably won't be great. It smells like leather because the leather's from Keystone, Pennsylvania, the welts are from Massachusetts, the upper's from Horween, the insoles from Pennsylvania, the lining's from Milwaukee. There's, there's, you know, that's what's gonna smell like. So you can make a bad product or you can make a good one. And then the second part that, you know, when it comes to the pricing side of it, um, we don't talk about it very much. You know, even our advertisements that we do on, on Facebook or Instagram, it's never really about the pricing because I, I know it's a, a battle. We won't really win because we don't have the cheapest Goodyear Well product. And really that was never my goal and it never will be, I hope, uh, mm. to, to make like the cheapest, uh, you know, Goodyear Well product. It's just, we make a boot and this is the price that we can do it and, and still keep, you know, the lights on. And, you know, if we could make the product cheaper, um, you know, lower the cost and, and provide the same product, I, I probably would have done that a while ago because I would sell more products and uh, have a lot less issues with, you know, my manufacturers and, yeah. and tanneries. Tell me what the philosophy is, because yeah. my, my perception is yep. we're going to make the best shoe that we can mm -hmm. at a great value. It's not necessarily the cheapest, but it's not the most expensive but you're gonna be able to compare it to the most expensive, yep. even though it's not. 
Yeah, and like, is is that the philosophy? What's the philosophy behind it? You know, and, and I, I guess again, when it comes to marketing side, I, that's not where. I, I excel because I don't even like using the word value because everyone, it's so arbitrary to what someone yeah. thinks. Um, True. I, and I, our shoes aren't cheap. Uh, you know, 370 for a boot for some people is a it's lot. A lot. And for some people they're like, well, I buy Crockett and Jones and I pay 700 and 370 doesn't seem like enough for this product. So it, it's kind of just, this is what we make. Hopefully, you know, today you can't find a suede buck just like this with the proportions of a true classic buck with all the right materials, whether it's the welts from Barber who's been making welts forever, Vegetan welts and your insoles and your nice lining from Thiele who's been, you know, making linings for Goodyear welt shoes for decades. Um, for, that looks like this, you know, put the price aside and just say, do you know, is that, you know, and then I, the price though, at the end, if you compare them all, yeah, it's very fair. You yeah, know? it's a fair um, price. It's, it's very fair. Um, and so, at the end of the day, yes, we're on the low side. I, I see from what you're saying is that yeah. you're trying to fill holes in the market of where footwear doesn't exist and you're trying to put the product in that hole yeah. and, and satisfy it at what you would say is a reasonable price given the components. Is that where you're thinking about when you come up with shoes? You're trying to, to hey, we need, you there's know, no, uh, what do you call it, a buck? Yeah, yeah, a suede buck. Yeah, I mean, I think so a little bit more now than when we started, where when I started it was it was literally, I have these connections with these tanneries because the factory has for all these years and whether it's CFSTED or Horween or you know Thiele or Keystone in Pennsylvania, we have these options to use their premier materials and, and make a product. Um, and there's only a couple of brands doing it, you know, especially in, in the US market to, you know, to sell and to buy in the US, but you know, Ours look different, regardless. You know whether it's, you know, very very similar to another brand's pattern or not. Um, you're going to find four or five brands that make a blue shirt very very similar to this pattern wise. But can you get it in this material, with this weld, with this color, with the steel shank? And yeah, yeah, exactly. With the components, with the last, and, and how it fits everything else. Um, it's going to be tough. I don't think so. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think so. You know, I would probably make it if it, if you could. Um, I, I don't think we would really succeed. Just you know. Um, making something like someone else and doing it cheaper because then you're just fighting about logistics who can buy more products and more material and make them bulk cheaper and it's like we're the total opposite from that you know um, yeah it just doesn't know, our, seem like there's yeah. any compromises made uh despite that yeah. sort of stigma of made in china i don't perceive yeah. any any difference yeah which i, mean, I think means that, yeah. that uh, again like i don't want to speak for you but yeah. i think that ex the gift that your dad gave you yeah for sending you to Horween at the tannery right and send you across the world to China to work in a factory and, and right. DW Frommer yeah uh, that gift of experience I think you are the reason that these are translating properly what I would describe as properly into the world I think your experience you know a good shoe sure and you could use any factory in the world and make a good shoe because you have those standards you know I I, I think it would be and could be kind of thought of like that um but honestly yeah that I, our factory and the management um it's probably you know it, it's why i'm here today and the type of product it is um yeah they're doing the hard work for sure and the heavy lifting because it really is like you know we just had a, a video conference yesterday about certain quality issues you know things coming in because that'll never end right you're always gonna have certain right. things small things um that'll always happen but yeah they're very vigilant and at this point, um, for them cutting corners, there's no point. I mean, they, we are a nuisance to the factory. You know, we're placing hundreds of pairs with them. So um, that is not what, you know, they're doing this in hopes from 10 years from now, we have, you know, a, a nice solid business making shoes. Volume per se isn't exactly um, the goal. I mean, it, again, volume could be, you're talking about tennis shoes, it's, it's ridiculous amounts. Um, and even some dress shoes, you know, even made in, in first world countries, you know, they're making hundreds and hundreds of thousands of shoes. Um, we're decades and decades away from that. And so I, I don't know if that's ever really the main goal. I, yeah. you know, right now, our real goal is um, maybe secure a line, which is we're not far away from that. You don't have to make that many shoes, you know, just kind of do what we're doing. And um, yeah, I think the last and, and the components and stuff, they just it just takes time and people, you know, they wear it. 
they like it, they kind of talk about it, and that's kind of what works. Let's move on to the leather chat here. Yeah. Why don't we start from that one there? Sure. So this is CF said, um, they're suede. Make great suede. That's what they do. Um, sometimes suede, I, because I, I don't know leather like you do, I didn't ever spend a lot of time in a tannery and kind of like see the, the science behind it and kind of like the differences between different tanneries. I know with suede, the aging, the fading, the color fastness properties, um, getting like the richness of the color out of a suede and then having it stay there for three, four years, you know, that's kind of some of those priorities, you know. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. It, it, it's cool that you said that because I wouldn't have said those things. And okay. I think those are probably more important than the thing. Because <laughs> my perspective, like you said, is tannery perspective. Yep. I just think of nap length. Right. And like, how, is it shaggy? Like, that is yep. a very tight nap. Yep. Or well, I'm saying these other tanneries other in China tanneries? and Taiwan, I mean, they're really good at that. I mean, if you get uh, kip suede and uh, what is it, uh, the goat suede and things like that, which is super fine for like women's shoes, you can definitely get nap tighter than this. Um, but I think sometimes we look at that too, like some of those, um, the, the kid skins, those, the kid suede, it's so fine, but it's kind of delicate. Mm. It's not as thick, so you can't really use it for a men's goodie well chew. It's more for like women's shoes. And that's kind of goes hand in hand with this type of English good your well heavy shoes you know even though this is a loafer it's like compare it to an english loafer mm -hmm. it's more finessed theirs is it's more finessed the details are a little bit tighter it looks smaller um it might be a little bit lighter where the, the english type of building shoe or american style which is kind of what we're doing it's heavier materials it's a thicker lining. We're using a you know a pretty substantial lining for a, a loafer. Um, these suede's are 1.2, 1.4 millimeter thickness, which is you know pretty good thickness for a suede calf suede. Um, butyl outsole from Keystone, you know that in the flex sole, things like that. So it's it's a pretty substantial like loafer where you could go pick up one from you know especially European loafers and stuff. They're much they're much more. Uh, I guess you say like dainty type of a thing. You know? So you pick the, the stead suede yep. on this one because it's a little bit more substantial, a little thicker. and Well, and I mean, really for the industry, they, that's what they do. I mean, for men's good your wealth business, I mean, I think they're they're the favorite, yeah. you know, and they just do it a lot. They do it do it very well. What do you, what yeah. do you choose on the, on the sole? Because that's a leather. This is a butyl sole from Keystone in Pennsylvania. Hmm. Um, so I think the story goes here was... I'm so ignorant on butyl. Okay. What's butyl? So butyl, that's the name that they, they coined it. And it was, I think before that, or maybe a, another version was called Waterlock. They made this outsole. They, they invented it. At the time, I want to say they were just, they did it for golf shoes. Good okay. do well golf shoes. And so they basically dunked the, the bends into this oil to saturate it. And it was supposed to be kind of like a, it would help it with the water resistance. Um, mm. And it would also so wear it a little harder. Soak up. Soak Correct. up moisture. May I help? Uh, yeah, a little more of like a repellent type of a, a, a thing. And oh, also, it's still quite firm. It, it is quite firm, but you know, they would market it as being more flexible because it is. It, it's yeah, not, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not trying to crease the hell out of your shoot, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but so it is a little more flexible than, than your like normal bark. When you uh, said tansel. soaked in oil, I'm imagining like drapey soft, but it does, yeah. So this is a really nice blue. Is that is that also stead suede? Yep. Yeah, so all of our suedes we buy from them, and I mean, Kind of the same thing. If, if one day we have a huge line, you kind of have the flexibility to say, hey, I would love to use this tannery's suede because of this reason for this product. And then for my boot, I want to use this, you know, but it's like consolidating into one tannery, you know, they appreciate it because our orders are so small. So yeah. like trying to, to, to meet their minimums and making an effort. Yeah, I mean, for, yeah. for what you're talking about, the, the quantities that you're running, Right. It seems like your gets just getting hooked up by fi right. or figuring out a way right. to make it work because right. like you said, the perspective from a tannery is we're not going to want to run. We need to run thousands of feet to make it In efficient. Run, right? yeah. yeah. So yeah, exactly. You have to fill the whole vessel. Right. You chose different soles for the two suedes and I mean, yep. they're different styles. Yep. But tell me about the thought process for choosing the, the sole that you chose on, on this tan suede. Sure. Uh, so like, th like this a was a shoe. Is that bones? What color is that suede? Yeah, this is just a tan. We yeah. call it the dirty buck. This shoe is, is really on its own. It's kind of a standoff product for us, completely on its own. And it was just released last week, actually. So this is our buck, which 
you know, the classic dirty buck from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and, you know, the, uh, the bass buck, you know, with the brick outsole with a suede upper and kind of getting worn in and, you know, kind of the Ivy League look. You know, like to my dad, like this is one of his favorite shoes of all time. Yeah. So to him, it's just classic. He's bringing back a classic. He's just like, why would you not make a tan buck? You know, our thought process is, you know, a lot of our customers, they, they did wear shoes like this. Um, but they don't want to buy a buck with, you know, pig lining and, you know, a non-leather insole, you know, footbeds and stuff like that. They they would like to have a, a normal Gucci Welt shoe with leather insoles and nice linings and, and things like that. So, yeah, yeah so to answer your question, uh, the Dirty Buck just always had like that brick EVA type outsole. Well, yeah. I want to move on to the, the, the I'm selfishly. Yeah. See, I like, I like all leathers, but I'm, yeah. I just have like a special place for the, the Horween stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, this is just, it's really just one of the most classic plain toe blue shirt patterns. You know, I mean, every English American brand, they usually all have one. The proportions might be a little bit different. Um, ours has a slightly shorter vamp, um, but really what makes it look different is probably the last. Our last, in general, it's a little bit wider. It's a little bit broader. Um, and I mean, our whole line is just like that. And the main reason is because um, really my, my dad's experience and then kind of him teaching me over the years as we're developing things in the American market, it's not very common for you to build a line in, in the last and for people to say, this is too much room. Uh, you know, I'm uncomfortable in it. It, it. I'm swimming in it. You know, it's uncomfortable. I, it's too wide. It's usually it's too narrow. It's the opposite. Always. Yeah. Always like that. It's difficult to make a, a wider, broader last look. Um, dressy or appealing and in, in especially in a dress sense of a way kind of being sleek and not just being like this huge clown type of a shoe sticking out of your pants you know what i'm saying so that's kind of what we've always done is making fuller last but then try to taper them whether it's making a little bit narrower at the toe and having a certain toe look or just not overly thick here um people so that's the secret it's a I, wide <laughs> four foot with like a, a yeah your ball toe. area your ball area is where I'm trying get to give trouble. you to get yeah. you to give away all the secrets yeah well the, the ball area is where everyone gets in trouble you know and we have plenty of customers you know first of all people see our line and they're like wow that that looks like a wide shoe hmm. you know or it there, doesn't it doesn't to me it looks yeah. sleek right and, I, yeah. and if you're also kind of used to looking at boots especially like yeah, higher I'm end a, boots and stuff I'm a boot guy then it wouldn't it wouldn't really look you know. But for a lot of people who wear dress shoes and things, they're kind of like, this it looks kind of full and broad and things. Even today, when we first started selling our D-Wits, I mean, it was amazing how people were like, these are too narrow for me, you know? And so we, when we went to E-Wits, and now we're into Tripoli, we just skip double and go directly to Tripoli hmm. because the amount of people you can fit in that is just, it's it almost covers the rest of the people that couldn't fit into the D or the E. Hmm. You know, it, it really, it covers a, a wide range. So a lot of people just have a tough time in the ball area. You yeah. think uh, it's just an American thing where we have wider forefoots or something? Or no, I mean our Japanese customers. We have one retailer in Japan, and you know, of course, spending time in China and everything else, it's like they have high insteps, high instep and a wider forefoot. I mean, it's that's even harder to fit. You know, yeah. um, you need even more volume here. You know, so some of these the boots and stuff that people um, wear, like in the Goodyear Welt boots, that's why they're so comfortable sometimes. Is they're wider, they're fuller. And you know they're not killing their instep of their foot, you know. So I'm, I'm super yeah. fascinated because of what you just said about uh, Japanese people's feet. Yeah. Because I I know that they love American style footwear. They just must be so uncomfortable. Is there something to that, or um, you know, well, there's certain lasts that brands will make that are specifically kind of designated for Japan, or that they will, if if a, if a brand has a line and they have a handful of lasts. There are a few of them that they'll make stuff for for their Japanese customers very, or very Asian cool. customers just because of higher end steps. I'd imagine people that are shopping for shoes, it's always yeah. my issues. Like, what the hell size do I get? Yeah. And I've read that you suggest people size down a half size. Yep. But how are you figuring? Yeah. And I want to tell everybody this. Why it came in and looked at my foot and said, oh, I know exactly what size shoe you are. And it must be pinching you right here and here. And it sort of blew my mind. And I think you're guiding me in a good direction of what size I want to get. Sure. So how would you advise somebody to size maybe Brannock device um, yeah. and then to get the proper width from, from Grant Stone boots and yeah. shoes? I mean, unfortunately, that 
because we're an online store, I should have a great answer for that. Sorry, <laughs> I ruined your day. Yeah, there, and that's the problem is there, there really isn't one, but what we do is what do you have in your closet? How does it fit? And, and you'll do a little back and forth if right, people want to message you. Our most general, you know, if I could take a thousand customers and give them one suggestion and get as many possibles, it'll be, hey, go down half a size because their average sneaker or their dress shoe, that they're going to be half a size smaller than whatever we have. Yeah, so myself, Josh, and Parker in the office, I mean, every morning that's what we do is we get in and check the emails and they kind of go through those sizing things with people every morning. Yeah. And it's, that's kind of the first step is, what do you have in your closet? And if things don't match up, then you know, show us a photo. Start by telling us and telling everybody out there yeah. uh, how you got started in this whole thing. Really, it started with my dad. I mean, he, um, he was in the shoe business you know, his whole life. Uh, his dad was at Alden. And then he spent, um, my grandpa, he was there for 60, 60, some years. And so then my dad started helping him at one point to do that. Um, he did that for probably 15 years. After he had left Alden, um, he had met the current owner of, uh, the current owner's um, father of, our, of the factory. And so at the time they were going through a transition, they had opened um, their factories, I wanna say at that time in, in China. And so, they were trying to make different types of footwear and looking for new customers. He had then asked me, you know, what I was, you know, I was kind of making a decision what to do with my, my this life. Is, this is when we first encountered each other. It is. And you were 18 back then? Yeah, I think I was, I would have been 18 years old. Gosh. Um, I was kind of making that call of, of going to school or doing something else. And my dad, he's kind of eccentric and stuff. And he's just like, well, why don't you just go to China and check out the factory and, and do all that, you know? And at the time, I was like, that sounds like a good idea. You know, I'll do that for sure. Uh, did a couple things like that. Went to a school on the, on the West Coast, um, D.W. Frommer. He does like Western boots. Right. Um, so he does a, a, like a short little bespoke school, you know, kind of makes a pair of boots with you. Um, and then after that, that's when I went to China to check out the factory. I was there for a few months and um, the factory owner, he's, he's a, a great guy and just he was basically like, yeah, you can stay in my apartment with me. I was like, okay, great, you know, and after a few months went by, he asked if, you know, do you want to stay a little longer? If there's things you could do and you're showing interest in it, how does that sound? And I was like, let's, let's do it, you know, and just never left, you know? So it was there for about eight years. Um, I didn't eight, realize that that's awesome. Yeah. So it's probably like the sixth, fifth, sixth year. That's kind of when we started talking about, you know, I sooner or later, I was probably gonna move back to the States, you know? Um, and wanted to continue with a factory, you know, like that, at that point, they're basically my family and, um, right. You know, I had a lot of family and friends over there and stuff, got married in China. And so like, I want to continue with a factory one way or another. Right. We talked about the idea of making your own brand and doing it that way. And um, yeah, just, it slowly kind of worked out. I mean, it really didn't make sense. This is Grant Stone that you're talking about. That, right. that was the inception moment. Right. Between you and the owner of the factory? Or? Correct. Yep. Oh. Yeah. And um, because they had tried this before, but in the past, you know, there wasn't this whole direct to consumer model to the extent that it is now, you know, online. Um, my dad and, and the factory owner, I mean, they, they actually made and used Grant Stone label. I mean, they, they came up with that name. And um, how did that come some, about, by the way? When my dad started working at Alden, um, there was a salesman. His name was Grant Stone. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so I didn't it was, know that. yeah, it was just, you know, my dad always loved him and he was a friend, a close friend of my grandpa's. My dad always had a great memory of this guy and his name and the way he carried himself. And he would not go anywhere without like, a sport coat and a tie and a hat kind of thing, like a true gentleman. And so he always loved that name too, like Grant Stone. Um, so I'm super curious when you were mentioning, uh, it sounds like you got an incredible immersive experience yeah. in China. Sure. But what was the, when you, those eight years, Yeah. you were doing what? You were learning every single step of the, the process or what, yeah. what was that like? Yeah, it, it was. And I mean, like, it's really the, the factory owner, he's very hands-on. Like he's there, you know, when there's production issues, whatever else, it runs through him, you know, and that's kind of how he is about everything. That's how he wanted me to be a little bit. So I spent, you know, the first year kind of staying at each station and stuff and learning about things. And I couldn't get maybe the full gist of things at first because I couldn't speak Chinese. So yeah. Do you speak Chinese um, now? I do. But nice. Yeah, it took forever and, and you know, how fluent and stuff is yeah. debatable, but- uh, You can get by. Yeah, it, it was more like, production, development, kind of just the whole thing when it came to footwear Super you know, for cool. the first few years and kind of learning more about it. 
probably two, three years in, it was more starting to develop making more samples for customers in the U.S., you know, like making dress shoes, ordering materials. So what, is that, what does that mean? Uh, is that like sketching out what a, a silhouette of a shoe would look like, or is that actually getting on a machine, cutting, and... So it'd be more coming up with certain patterns and then saying like, okay, you know, there's a traditional, like a saddle shoe, like this is what your traditional saddle shoe looks like, yeah. but which last should it be on? And then we have to sit there and go like, you know, do we use an existing last or, you know, which a factor would love to do because especially for samples and stuff, they're like, Let, let's not go make new, new last for a sample. Expensive. Or, or for, definitely for a saddle shoe, please. Mm -hmm. Kind of going through that thing and then presenting whether it's an array of like six half pair or 30, you know, you know, different styles, just whatever we think that customer would need. What market them. were they trying to fulfill was it in the yeah. american market yeah it was goodyear welts uh men's men's shoes that was my job was more for the first three four years was more in-house just a production and development um and then it kind of slowly turned into being more of uh, developing and working with the customer yeah to do that i mean you have to be there you have to be the factory and, and everything else you know you I mean, always had wanted to come back to live in, in michigan you know i i wouldn't mind to live there still and, and you know after i got married there my wife i mean she's not She's just now starting to get like accustomed to the U.S. and she's still not used to it for sure. You know, yeah. maybe not so much the U.S. part, but just not living in a city. I see. So come move to Chicago. We got a, we got a good place here. <laughs> she loves it. I mean, she would. Love she likes Chicago. Oh, she'd love to. Bring her now. We'll take you out to dinner. Take yeah. you guys out. Yeah, I mean, she would love to. You know, yeah, that'd be great. Really, man. really would. Yeah, it'd be fun. When I came back, it was we already had started Grant's Home, but we realized we needed a warehouse. Like you can't have someone else warehousing your shoes and stuff because there's going to be issues like it's inevitable that's actually super interesting that you yeah. say that and i wonder if you have the same experience that we do is with all the leathers that we use and we use all hormine stuff but yeah. they have so much wax and oil in them that mm -hmm. if you let the the wallet or boot or shoe in this example sit there for a week the blooming the, stuff, yeah. the, the temperature change causes those waxes to come back out so yeah. that's why we choose to polish it right before it goes out the door and i yeah. could see that being a similar problem yeah. for shoes. Yeah, we do. And I mean, like, for example, something something like this, the Chrome Excel, I mean, yeah, if you brush it, and I just brush it today, that's why it looks like that. But uh, it doesn't usually look like that in the box, like you said, it's got a bunch of wax and stuff on top. So yeah, the, the small things like that make a huge difference. And then, I mean, you know, we have a lot of returns. And so the returns part of it- You got sizing to deal with. It's it's going to happen. And like, you need to be on top of that for every pair, you know? It's smart to do that though. So, well, as, as opposed to having a big distribution center figure it out for you. Yeah, Better guess, customer service, right? Yeah, and I, and I don't I don't know, like with this type of product, I, I don't know if a lot of people do that just because it's so tough. Um, you know, kind of sourcing it out. Yeah, I think it's so difficult to, to be hands off with that, with this type of shoes, you know? Super curious, so you said eight years in China. Yeah. And then the brand started in that time, towards the end of that time period? Yeah, probably five, six years in. I think we started talking about it and then actually started making the shoes, you know, like placing the order and actually going through the development for the, um, the, the, the patterns and everything and, and starting to cut in the end of 2015. What made you leave China? I probably, I could still be there and kind of doing a little more of the production development side, being more hands-on with the product itself versus... Uh, the brand side of it, um, the customer service. Even now that I'm here, the majority of my job is still leaning towards the development and just managing the everyday business with the marketing, advertising, and stuff. Yeah. Um, there's only three people in the office, you know, at, at for for us at Grant Stone in in Michigan. So I, I could do it back in China, but really it was more, you know, we had just gotten married there, and it's being an expat there. I mean, it can be pretty difficult as far as you know permits and wanting to live there. You know, do you do you get these visas all the time and you have to keep doing it and renewing mm -hmm. them, uh, buying a property or like a home or an apartment, you know, it's, it was a big undertaking. I decided not to do that. And it just felt more comfortable. I, I think to, to be back here, we want to start a family and stuff. We could have done it. And I think looking back at it now, I think my wife, sometimes she's kind of nudging me like, you want to go back, you know, but, uh, no, I, there's a lot involved there and I'm just, you know, I, I'm not sure. And yeah. it's more of a family thing, you know, deciding to stay here. That's that's got to be tough with schools uh, and stuff, and with, well, with your wife, yeah. her, I'm assuming her family is there, and yours Correct. is here. That's got to be. Yeah, and her mom point. is here, so we we go back once or twice a year. Let's broach the, the yeah. coronavirus chat. Yeah. Does that affect your thinking about visiting it, uh, China at the moment? Well, yeah, I mean, we had our tickets. We were leaving at the end of this month, you know, and, and so those got wow. funded and stuff, so we couldn't go. How does that affect the factory, if at all? Yeah, it definitely does. I mean, um, 
for us right now, I mean, we're so small that we're only placing a few orders a year. I mm -hmm. mean, I shouldn't say a few orders. We're placing four to five bigger orders a year, bigger being um, a relative you know, term, relative to, our, <laughs> right. to what we do. Uh, quite small for the factory, but and then we'll do some fill-ins in between that to drive them nuts. But we we place those in between that, to help us with the sizing. So somebody really wants this cap to, but yeah. are they going to be waiting an extra long time because no. of what's happening over there? Or? No, I mean we we've made a pretty big effort. Like we don't have a bunch of styles, you know, we don't, it's been pretty straightforward since we started. We didn't introduce a ton of them, which has been kind of one downside, but the upside was we're trying to get wits and stock everything. So like right now at this given moment, I think, you know, we probably have, you know, over 90% of those, uh, of this boot in stock, six to 13 D and E wits. We're, we're trying to keep up with it, you know, and to keep extra inventory where possible. Um, but yeah, the coronavirus, I mean, it's just, our factory was shut down for an extra month and a half after Chinese New Year. Jeez. And then now that they're back, you know, they have to self-quarantine for 14 days before returning to work. One of the friends who, who does the development for us on that side, you know, she was back in, I think, right in the first week of March. But it's like, you know, they can't go to school yet. The schools are closed down. And maybe at this point, it's not even so much of um, a health issue, but it's just like business side. It's like, you know, for people that they realize that the numbers, especially in China, it's not good, but it's not like overwhelming, you know, like you're afraid to to go outside and get it at this point because it seems to be slowing down a little bit. But business wise, I mean, restaurants and just, you know, just I mean, shut everything it down. there's logistics and, and everything else. I mean, yeah, it's not looking good, especially now that it's in Europe and US, you know, people are being cautious. So well, let's try to lighten the mood. Yeah. <laughs> let's yeah. lighten the mood and talk about some leather. Yeah, exactly. Are we got so depressed and sad that we had to lighten the mood here with uh, some round you brought me this thank you for yeah. the round barn brewery and these are right. next to your warehouse yeah it's it's the brewery right next to our warehouse yeah this is a very tasty treat i wanted to answer a question from lou blanc uh, for you yeah <laughs> sure and lou wants to know when are you restocking the shell boots so the deal with these shell boots right now is just that we're getting smaller amounts of shell every you know every few months you know mm -hmm. that's kind of what we're doing right now um and we're usually hold, holding pre-orders and the main reason is because we have x amount of material and you know a lot of customers they want an e width they yeah. want a triple e and a plain toe shoe you know something like that and so we can actually go and make exactly what they want versus us stocking you know All hundreds of size. pairs and yeah. still missing probably every two three months we'll be coming out with some shell stuff um, nice yeah and about the dress boots unfortunately probably nothing much dressier than this here, which is... Oh, yeah. Lou says, any plans to make a dressy shell boot? Yeah. yeah. So probably nothing much dressier than this, which is still on the Leo Last. Um, this is the cap toe. It does. It looks a little bit dressier than, you know, for example, the diesel or, or that uh, plain toe boot there. So we'll probably do it in this soon, though. Cool. So, yeah. What do you think is um, the next steps for Grant Stone? Are there any new products that are coming that people should get excited yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. We... We're going to be moving into, you know, that, that plain toe boot there actually is something new for us. And while it, the shell one, yeah, yeah, while that pattern is subtly, you know, different than this one, um, that is something new for us and it'll allow us to try some different materials and, and kind of keep them separate, um, and offer some more products. We have a tassel loafer coming. So kind of like that, the classic tassel loafer, we'll be doing that. Um, and, and actually trying a new, um, I guess not exactly new for us, but introducing a new Italian calf, which will cool. be, yeah, it's a really nice leather and it's something a little bit different from what we currently offer, which is more substantial, uh, tougher leathers, thicker leathers, things like that. And then this holiday, we plan on introducing like our first real work boot. Yeah, so. What's so real compared to, <laughs> these are not <laughs> real, <laughs> these are fake? Yeah, I, I guess. Uh, With like a lug sole kind of thing? Yeah, or, aesthetically, yeah. you know, where this kind of has the leather sole, um, even the rubber sole ones, I mean, they're they're made to be very, very subtle, something that almost looks like leather from, you know, if you're wearing it. Um, it has grip and everything else, but I mean, this isn't something that guys necessarily going to go out into the, uh, you know, the yard and work in and, and whether or not people do that in their indie boots and stuff, you know. Well, what's I your guess, ideal you know? uh, work boot leather then? What is... Honestly, because I thought you would have said this guy. The, uh... Yeah, well, I mean, it really is. It's going to be, it'll be the Horween ranges. It'll be the likes of a Badalassie. But it's it's a different last, so it's going to be a thicker wall last, thicker toe, um, and then really just because of the look and and it being a work oriented boot, probably put something a little bit heavier on the bottom. So a heavier lug, crepe, 
something like that, something you wouldn't really put on something that's semi business casual. Driving. I want to wrap it up again and thank yeah. you for coming here. But uh, yeah, you want to compare wallets really quick? Because what yeah. year did you get your Herbie? So I, I forgot how it all happened. I don't even know when I saw your website because the time when I, I met you, I don't. You weren't doing this. We right? in, in 2008. We did. We did not even right. have an inkling of okay. anything. Right. We started Ashland in 2011. Okay. So. So maybe it was social media. Maybe it was an email. I know I had shot you emails about Halloween leathers over the years. So I got this. That was probably 2013 ish. 2014. Yeah. So yeah, this is. So you six, got seven years on this. Six seven six, years. Yeah. And uh, Math. yeah, it's it's <laughs> awesome. Um, That's looking great. Day. I mean, I'll show in a little B-roll here of the before and after here, but the yeah. way that that has worn is incredible. What yeah. I like Fat Herbie personally. Like yeah. that's the one, you know, this is my Herbie here. That's the one I choose to wear. Yep. But what is it about the Herbie for you that you like? I mean, the only reason was because I could fit Chinese R&B. Yeah, They're really it fits tall. all the currency. They're really tall bills and, and it covered it completely, no issue. Uh, so at the time I was living in China and then I got it and I'm like the cuts of shell or Chrome Excel or Latigo, whatever you're using, they're so big. It's awesome. Yeah. You, know, you can see the character versus the smaller cuts, you know, it's, that's awesome. So that's yeah. why I liked your whole cuts. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like the sort of simplicity of it. And, uh, what's cool about that too, is you're, you're right. There's something about like extra context. Sure that makes the leather more interesting, especially on in the, stuff, yeah. especially in stuff like the marble. Sure. I don't know how much of that you've seen. Yeah. But that, when you get big pieces of, uh, on the it's Herbie, awesome. it's super cool. Yeah. Well, thanks again for uh, spending all this time with me. Of and uh, I can't wait to have you back again. Yeah, really thank great, you. It was fun. Really great to, to see all these shoes in person. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. So thanks, everybody out there. Yeah, if anybody has you. questions for Wyatt, I'm going to make sure Wyatt gets back to you. Okay, we'll take yeah. some questions no problem, if anybody yeah. needs some help. And I'll put your email address or like a yeah. contact info yeah. in the comment section. So thanks again, everybody, and hope you have a good day. Awesome.